So one, one comment for the speakers is um, please repeat questions when they're asked because people in the back can't hear the questions often, especially if the questioner is talking. So our, our next talk is by David Spivak, who um, is at MIT, and he's going to give us a talk about categorical aspects of um, compositionality. David? Great. Thanks. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Um, this is a perfect conference for, for what I want to think about these days. Um, so I'm going to say, as, as you know, as I'm going to talk about things that uh, other people have said, and I'll just kind of say them in a more theoretical uh, or more category theoretic way, just because I like that. Um, and maybe I'll and yeah. So I want to kind of define what I mean by compositionality before before we start. And I think we've already said it, but I want to say it kind of more formally. So. Um, so what do I mean by composition? I, I work a lot with engineers, and I want to use the word composition the way they use the word composition. So I mean assembling many things together to make one thing. So we'd say that Y is composed of some pieces that are assembled together. And oh, blue it means things, and red means arrangements, and green means nesting. So I'll just have that color coding, because they say color on slides is nice. So. Um, so we have these, we have pieces x1 through xn, and we're, we're going to specify how they're arranged to create some kind of bigger thing y. And we can arrange these nestings, we can nest these arrangements inside of each other. So this natural, naturally leads to this notion of an operad or multi-category. And an operad specifies what are the things we're going to be talking about, um, what are the arrangements by which one thing is composed <coughs> of many things, and how does nesting work? And so those are the objects, the morphisms, and the composition formula of the, of the operad. And by the way, when I say operad, I mean what's usually called a colored operad. It has lots of different objects, not just one. It could have one, uh, <coughs> obviously. Um, also called a, a multi-category or a symmetric multi-category. Um, I like operad because it's small and sounds like operation. And, and I usually think of algebras of these things which is what operads were invented for, was for cataloging algebras of something. So, um, so just to picture what these look like, the diagrams I like to draw uh, often look like this. And this is an arrangement. Z is formed as an arrangement, an assembly of things Y1 and Y2, where Y1 and Y2 are each arrangements of smaller things X1 through whatever. And so in the operatic picture, people usually draw arrows like this. So this is a multi-arrow from x11, x12, x13 to y1. Uh, but if you kind of turn that from being left to right into being inside and outside, x11, you know, these guys are inside of y1, and these guys are inside of y2. And in the way Peter May, who invented operads, uh, uh, talked about the little cubes operad, et cetera, it's the same kind of picture that you're seeing there. It's just that now we're wiring them together. And that wiring together is what we mean by the morphism in the operad. So uh, the nesting says you can put, you know, this Y box is actually just a one in, two out box. And, and so it too, so maybe I'm not saying something very uh, understandable at this point, but, but I'm trying to say that I'm, I'm arranging things inside of bigger things and you can nest them and compose them. And this is, this is an operad. This is a picture of, of an operad a very specific operad of wiring diagrams. So an operad specifies a theory of composition. What are we going to be composing, and how do we arrange them? There are these sorts and operations of a theory of composition. Um, this is, I think Gordon also pointed this out when he said, uh, you know, in my theory, likes is not part of the, not part of the theory of composition, and in your, in your theory it is. So choosing your operad is choosing what you mean by composition. Um, functorial semantics is that a model of this uh, operad is a functor from O to set, or, I mean, Gordon said to anything else. Sometimes I like to send them to set or to cat, or, but some semantic space where they have a lot of freedom. So to every sort in your operad, for every thing, uh, for every type of thing, you have all the things of that sort. That's the set that an object goes to. And for every arrangement in your operad, you have a function that takes a thing of sort one and a thing of sort two and a thing of sort n and produces a thing of sort y according to that arrangement. 
and that's just a functor from O to set. Um, so given a tuple of things and a rule for assembling them, <coughs> you obtain a new thing. And so this is what I mean by composition, and I, I think it's a very standard way of saying what composition is. I just wanted to say it explicitly, as explicitly as possible. So what do I mean by compositionality? I, I think it's a well-known term, and, and maybe many people have defined it, and I just wanted to define it again. Uh, what I mean by it, to make sure that it's the same. My, my, uh, my dad always told me that Einstein said, if you don't know something, say it loud. So I don't know how well-known, you know, what we all mean by composition. And, and I want to say what I mean and, and hear, you know, uh, uh, re responses to that. So um, an attribute, so when I, when I say something is compositional, what kind of thing can be compositional? To me, it's an attribute of something that can be compositional. We're looking at some system, we're trying to analyze it, we're talking to, uh, I'm often talking to scientists and engineers, they want to understand something they didn't before, they want to analyze something. Um, so you want to be able to say, well, if you analyze it this way, you're going to be able to compose those analyses together. Um, so an attribute is like a projection onto a simpler, simpler space, like an attribute of an ordinary difference equation or an open dynamical system or something, is it's a set of steady states. So you've taken something complex, like an ordinary differential equation, and you've mapped it onto a simpler space, and that's an attribute. I'm just trying to define words here. So an attribute of a function, one attribute is, are you injective or not? So we're projecting all of functions, set of functions, onto the set of booleans. Um, but when, when is some, an attribute compositional? It's when, uh, it's when it, you have a, what, a natural transformation of functors. So I'm trying to say mathematically what, what we could mean by that. So we have this compositional theory O, and we have this model M, or algebra of O, from, uh, that tells us what the things of each sort are. And we have a system of attributes for this thing. So for every, we have a, a simpler space N, another O model, and to every sort we have an attribute that takes the more complex stuff to the more simple stuff. And the compositionality aspect of it, which Gordon also wrote in his talk, and, uh, uh, is just that you know, this commutes, it's natural transformation. That if you take things x1 through xn and you compose them according to arrangement phi in the model, and then you analyze that big system, which is very complex, uh, that you could have done it in an easier way. You could have taken each thing and analyzed it, found that simpler attribute, and then compose those attributes together. So when someone says, is the thing, you know, is this the whole the sum of its parts, they're asking, uh, well, often they, I think they were asking, if I don't know phi, can I figure out can I analyze my big system from my parts? And that's, the answer is no. If you don't know the interactions between your things, it's very rare that you're going to be able to analyze a big thing by just knowing quantities applied to each of the small things. How many uh, of this organelle is in my cell or something? I mean, you, you have to know kind of how things are, are, are arranged. But I think a question that we, we, it almost is the definition of a model, is that if you're modeling something and you like your model, then you better say that the, the interactions you're thinking about and the things you're thinking about and, and the analysis work together in this way. So compositionality just says that two things are the same. You can either compose the pieces in the complex space and then project via the attribute, or you can project via the attribute and then compose according to your arrangement. So let me give two examples. This one I'll talk about in more depth, and then the other one I'll just pass through. So, Taking steady states is a compositional analysis of dynamical systems. So there's an operad for composing dynamical systems. It's almost, they're almost like a traced ca trace monoidal category. Uh, but there's an operad whose, whose pictures look like this, whose morphisms look like this. And there is a, uh, a model or a functor or an algebra from W to set that asks, that puts in each box any dynamical system and then pr composes them to create a dynamical system in the outer hole. And I'll define dynamical systems later. Quick, quick. Yes? Sorry to interrupt, but when I look at this diagram, it looks like it has feedback. If I thought of information flowing in that, then outputs would go back to inputs, and that would affect the things that are making outputs again. So do you mean to have feedback in that diagram? So the question was, do I mean to have feedback? And I definitely mean to have feedback in this diagram where information is flowing out of x5 and back into x4, 
or other information is flowing out of X5 and back into X1. So yes, I definitely mean that. Oops. Okay, and what I'll talk about later is that there's a compositional analysis from uh, one model of this operad to another model of this operad. One model is dynamical systems can go in each box, and another, operat, uh, another model that doesn't feel like it has feedback at all is putting matrices into each box. Um, if you put matrices in X1 and X2, you might be able to multiply them, but what happens when you have all this complex stuff? You can also, there's a model of matrices for this type of string diagram, and I, I'm going to talk about that. And the point is that uh, there's an analysis or a way of looking at dynamical systems which, is, which produces a matrix out of any dynamical system. And those, uh, that, that analysis is compositional. You can, you can know the steady states of the whole dynamical system by composing matrix-wise the steady states of the pieces. And by steady state, someone else said the word fixed points, and that's the same word. And equilibria, that's the same word. Uh, not the same word, same meaning. <laughs> okay, example two, I'm just going to pass through this one. Uh, there's an operad for composing hierarchical protein materials. So I just want to kind of give the breadth of what I mean by operad, uh, uh, or using operads for talking about composition. So what is a protein? It's an arrangement of simpler proteins. And what is a protein? Well, so um, there are, are atomic proteins. In, in you know, operatic theories, you don't need a base level. But if you have one, then, then, well, typically scientists have liked those historically. Uh, and philosophers, I guess, you know, they like to have basic stuff. So, so uh, amino acids are the basic ones. And protein materials can be, uh, are very, you know, complex things. They include your skin. And with molecular dynamic simulators, you can make an actual model of, um, of this algebra. So what can you do? You can assemble a new protein from a set of other proteins by assembling them in series, like popping those uh, amino acids together, or in parallel, or arranging them in helices. So if you have some library of proteins you've already made, you could take the ones and, and attach them together, or you could you know, bend them into some spiral. So this is like a helix of helices. Each one of these guys is bending. And we just made this little picture by plopping it in, you know, plopping some, uh, some amino acids into this, um, this kind of operatic protein, uh, programming language. Now, if you had a compositional analysis of this, it'd be incredibly useful, incredibly because I would find it pretty non-credible <laughs> that you could actually do that. But it'd be great if you could assign to each amino acid or each protein a strength or a toughness or whatever people uh, study in material science. And then when you compose them by attaching or putting them in parallel, you'd have a formula that told you an expected strength or toughness of the new material. I mean, I think this would be kind of the holy grail of material science or, or of, of protein material science. Um, and even if it wasn't perfectly compositional, I think that'd be a very, a very valued, um, valued thing to have. It tells you that you can guess uh, what you're going to get uh, strength-wise by, by looking at the strength of the pieces and how they fit together. So in this talk, uh, I'm going to talk about operads of string diagrams because I guess um, for me, composition uh, in my history started with uh, composition in the category. So uh, I'm going to talk about category theory and different what I call doctrines. I haven't found a good name for these things. Some people call them notions of monoidal category. That's what Peter Selinger calls them because I looked to him to, to tell me what to call these things. But I, I'm going to talk about operads for monoids and categories and traced monoidal categories and hypergraph categories, with, which um, Brendan will talk about later. And um, then I'll talk, I'll, I'll talk about the steady states of dynamical systems. And, um, and finally, conclude with a few more words on compositionality or what happens when you don't have it. OK, so do I stop at 11.30 or 11.35? Okay. So string diagram, diagrams are attributed to Penrose and Joyal, Street, Verity, other people. Um, they give us a visual tool for solving algebra problems. You can look at, you can look at the algebra problem in a string diagram language and, uh, and guess, uh, well, you know, you can use your, vi your visual system to answer questions um, about whether two, two morphisms are equal, for example. So how do operads come into play? We can organize the string diagrams for one of these doctrines as an operad O. Um, 
so the connection between the string diagrams and their meaning is this functor from O to set. So here's an example of a, of a string diagram for trace monoidal categories. Um, in any trace monoidal category where you, uh, each of these would be filled with a uh, morphism, each string would have a label on it that told you what the objects coming in and the objects coming out are. Um, so, uh, and, and one of these would denote a morphism in that monoidal category, in that trace monoidal category. But what is this picture as a mathematical object? You could say it's, uh, I forget, some kind of graph. Uh, I, I forget how uh, Joyal and Street and Verity described it, but um, some kind of graph embedded into Rn. But it's, th there are simpler ways of talking about it. And so let me start easy with the string diagrams for monoids using the operatic language. So it's, it's well known that the terminal operad T is the theory of monoids. The terminal operad has one object which I'll just draw with a box with two lines coming out of it. And it has one n area morphism for any n. And I'll draw that as just how many boxes I put inside of one box. So if I want to put three boxes inside of one box, this is the only way to draw it, uh, that there's one of those. And so a model of t, whenever I say a model of, that's supposed to be a script t, uh, whenever I say a model of an operad I, or, or an algebra, I mean a functor to set, at least today. So, it assigns to the unique object of the operad a set, which is your monoid elements, your set of elements of your monoid. And it assigns to the unique n area oper operation a single function from m times m times m to m. And the composition <coughs> formula of T ensures the associativity and unitality of your monoid. So we can think of this as kind of an unbiased perspective on monoids in the sense that instead of thinking about two generators for monoids, namely, we have a unit, we have a multiplication, and we have some rules about associativity, so that's generators and relations approach. It's kind of an unbiased approach in that it, it puts all the operations, whether it's one or two or three, uh, uh, multiplying one or two or three or n things together on equal footing. Now, unbiased sounds good, like everyone should be unbiased, but it does, that's not true. You don't have to be unbiased. You can have biases. Um, it's very convenient for calculation to have biases, but it's sometimes good to be able to be unbiased also. So I, I'm not trying to use that as a positive word, I'm just trying to use it as a, as a descriptive word. Um, string diagrams focus on morphisms, not objects. So to talk about uh, what a category is from this perspective, it's going to be a monoid plus labels, and the labels are going to be kind of the objects. Um, or types. The labels and types, the, I mean the same thing by label and type. So the downside that I find with using operads, and it doesn't hit, hit very often, but things, it, the thing that makes it a little harder to advertise is that they're parametric on objects in a way that I'm, I'm not very happy with. So there's no operad for categories. There's lots of operads for lots of categories in the sense that if you fix your object set lambda, then there's an operad for lambda categories, categories whose objects are lambda. Um, so I haven't really settled on a way of dealing with this in a nice way, because I, I really like the operad, operatic approach for string diagrams, but I don't like that I have to be parametric in, in the objects. But let's just choose my set of objects, lambda, or labels, or types. Um, define O lambda as the following operad. Its objects are pairs of types that are going to stand as the domain and codomain of a morphism. And the n area operations are uh, just tuples of labels such that the, you know, x0, x1 is the labels for x1, and x1, x2 is label for x2, etc., and y is the outer labels, x0, x3. So it says that if I have a sequence of morphisms, I mean, in, in the semantics it says, if I have a sequence of morphisms such that the domains and codomains match up correctly, then I can compose them. So again, it's kind of an unbiased uh, approach to instead of having just a two area and a zero area composition, a, a unit and a, and a multiplication, there's an n area multiplication. So kind of, uh, there's a more interesting or more kind of uh, interesting connection that comes about for traced monoidal categories, which are that they have to do with um, kind, of, kind of like TQFTs, although I'm only saying that because I've met someone who thinks about TQFTs, 
But in other words, functors from Cobb, the category of cobordisms, oriented cobordisms, to set. So forgetting about string labels because they just kind of complicate the, um, you know, they, they, add a, they add one extra bit of notation. Functors from the category of cobordisms to sets, zero, uh, one, one cobordisms to set, is equivalent to traced monoidal categories. So if you're allowed to draw diagrams like this and compose morphisms in a traced monoidal category, what are diagrams like this? They are cobordisms. This is a picture of a cobordism just drawn in a different way. How does that work? A cobordism, a, a one cobordism is a cobordism between two, two, zero, two oriented zero manifolds. And a zero manifold is a signed set. It's a finite set of, um, of pluses and minuses. So x1 here is two minuses and a plus. x2 is one, plus and two, uh, one minus and two pluses. And y is two minuses and two pluses. And so I've, you know, knowing that x1a is attached to x2b, as you can see here, and knowing, knowing all of this stuff is just drawing a cobordism. <laughs> Another doctrine that seems to be useful in application is hypergraph categories. And I, I find the usual definition of hypergraph category to be a bit involved. Um, it's a symmetric monoidal category C in which each object is equipped with the structure of a monoid and a co-monoid, and they satisfy a bunch of additional axioms. <coughs> but it's really easy from a string diagram perspective. You're just wiring together uh, little circles inside a bigger circle. <coughs> so you draw these hypergraphs. The, the objects are x, or the nodes are x1, x2, x3, and there's uh, hyper edges, which are shown with these little links, these little dots there. There's a one-area hyper edge. There's a three-area hyper edge that connects things. And um, in fact, this is a picture of a co-span. So in the, last, in the last slide, I was saying this is a picture of a, this is a picture of a cobordism. And now I'm saying uh, this is a picture of a co-span. So what's the co-span? I have sets x1, which is a three-element set. x2 is just a three-element set. x3 is a four-element set. X4 is a two element set, and Y, the outer thing, is a three element set, just the number of ports. And so I have a co span uh, from that, that kind of union of sets to the set of links here. <coughs> Every port is being attached to one link. Do you have uh, links that don't get hit? And you have links that don't get hit. Brendan and Alex Kissinger say no, and I say I don't care. <laughs> um, so, so can a hyperedge be incident to zero vertices? Thank you. <laughs> you made my slide relevant. Um, if yes, then you're working with cospans. If no, you're working with correlations. You're saying they're jointly surjective maps. Um, so, what are examples of hypergraph categories? Uh, uh, Baez and Fong have passive linear circuits as a functor from this operad to set. H is just, H is just cospan, so H shouldn't look complicated. Um, the category of relations is, is a hypergraph category. The category of arrays or tensors is a hypergraph category. Um, you can compose arrays together to get, make a new array, and I'll be talking about that later with the dynamical systems. So if you have any semi-ring K, then arrays with entries in K uh, will form a functor from H to set, uh, a model of this theory of composition. So I don't know if this is really worth saying really carefully. So um, if you're a little, so in these pictures here, you have, you have little cells with ports. And we're going to wire them together. So given a cell with ports, that's x. It's got not only a set of ports, but it's also got a label for each port, namely uh, a finite set of um, indices for your array. So suppose, suppose you had two ports, and on port one you had the number m, and on port two you had the number n, so you have a circle with two lines coming off it, labeled m and n. Then by x bar I just mean m times n, and array x is functions from m times n to your semi-ring k. So it just fills in every entry with uh, a value. And then for any cospan like this, there's an array multiplication formula. 
given an array here, an array here, an array here, an array here, you can multiply them in some kind of obvious way and get an array for the outside thing. So uh, here's some examples of well-known operations. They weren't all well-known to me, but, but they're well-known to people. So a matrix multiplication <laughs> corresponds to this wiring diagram. What's called catri rao multiplication, that's the one I didn't know before, corresponds to this uh, wiring diagram. The trace of a, of a matrix where you have an, M by, an n by n matrix, you can just find a one-dimensional one matrix there. You can do the Hadamard product uh, with this wiring diagram. You can do the Kronecker product with this wiring diagram. Or you can take your matrix and kind of add up along the rows or along the columns with this wiring diagram. People call, the, these, people call these four products, but they don't call these product, matrix products. Maybe because there's only one. OK, I learned something. Um, so what's the real role of operads in all this? All, what I'm talking about is string diagrams and how for every string diagram, there's an operad O. And the operad just allows you to change the string. Uh, a functor between operads allows you to change the string diagram type. So if you know that every string diagram of type 1, that operad maps into this operad uh, of type 2, then you get an adjunction between models of one and models of the other. Um, now, working with the doctrines directly is often preferable to using operads. Working with traced monoidal categories is often preferable to working with Cobb algebras uh, because people understand it faster. We're more used to it. We can calculate with those, um, with those things. You don't have to worry about object labels, which, as I said, uh, annoys me. But another, another thing, uh, there are reasons to prefer operads. Namely, you're not restricted to looking at these named doctrines like traced monoidal categories. You can look at any string diagram calculus you can think of. So uh, trace categories without identities come up for me in dynamical systems. Um, but how do you define a trace category without identities? Most of the axioms use the identities to define them. But it's perfectly natural to write down what the operad looks like. It's actually pretty easy. I'll talk about it on the next slide a little bit. Um, and, and it's you know, an unbiased thing. And another thing I like about it is that engineers, which I work with scientists and engineers a lot, they, they seem to find the perspective of building one thing from many compelling. So if you do want to work with someone uh, for, uh, outside of math, I think that, that it's, it's a convenient way of talking with people. OK. Am I going to talk about that? Yeah. OK, so what are dynamical systems? Prakash talked about them. Uh, but they're, they're machines that take an input, uh, like through your eyes uh, and ears, change their state according to the input they receive and according to the state they're already in. Like if I'm sad and I see something, I'm different than if I'm happy and I see the same thing. I change my state and then I produce outputs and I express myself through my motor uh, system or through just some wires coming out and, and I send signals on. So usually dynamical systems come in one of two flavors, actually three, discrete, continuous, or hybrid. Um, but we'll talk about discrete and continuous today. And all of, our open, all of our dynamical systems are open systems. They can interact with other systems. So if you have a pair of sets, say manifolds or sets, I would draw all the dynamical systems that can fit in this box are those that take in inputs from x in and spit out outputs in x out. What is a discrete dynamical system? It's a set or manifold of states. It's an update function that takes in an old state uh, and uh, input and gives you a new state, or takes an old state and an input and gives you a tangent direction, like some ordinary differential equation. So when I say discrete dynamical, when I say continuous dynamical systems, these are kind of open, uh, ordinary differential equations that have taken input and give out output. Um, the output function is here sometimes called the readout function. So dynamical systems can be composed almost like in a trace category, but not quite. Because if you allow identities, you can't have feedback. And if you have feedback, you can't have identities. Or if you want both, then you don't have totality. You get kind of a partial thing. And so I, I, I think this is related to uh, the, the trace ideals. Actually, I'm pretty sure it's related to the trace ideals of Bramsky, Blut, and Penangadin. Uh, so something like this should be true. I, I've talked with Rick about it, and we both believe it, but we haven't proved it formally. That if you have any symmetric monoidal category C, there's an operad, I'll call it W sub C, with the following properties. 
the category of traced ideals in C, or the way that tra traced ideals compose, the traced ideals in C are the functors from W to set. And not only that, but WC is the left class of a factorization system on Cobb. So it's basically these Cobb diagrams, but not all of them. So dynamical systems form a traced ideal in this sense, um, letting W be the operad W subset or W submanifolds. A discrete dynamical system or a continuous dynamical system is a functor or algebra or model W to set. Uh, the wiring diagrams look like this. The only thing I'm not showing here is one where there's a passing wire. And so that's exactly what the traced ideals, or at least the way I conceptualize it, are avoiding is, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're actually avoiding any function from, from the, um, they're main, I think they're mainly avoiding the identities. So they're avoiding these passing wires, and that's the kind of thing I don't allow in these pictures. And the left class of a factorization system eliminates those. Oh, wow, I'm really behind. Okay, so steady states are a compositional analysis means that dynamical systems form a model. Uh, we already said that, and there's a compositional analysis that asks for the steady states. So my matrices are valued in zero and one, or other case, other <coughs> semi-rings could also work. But by the steady state of a dynamical system, I mean um, you pick an input, you pick an output of that system, and you ask, are, is there a steady state? Is there a state such that the update of that state at that input is the same state? Is there a fixed point? And is it reading out y? And that arranges your steady states into a matrix. And you can compose those matrices according to matrix arithmetic, according to the wiring diagram. If, if, you're in a, if you're in a continuous system, such a matrix is called the bifurcation diagram of your system. So if you have a, a differential equation or, or a dynamical system, you can write what's called the bifurcation diagram and compose those according to matrix arithmetic to get the bifurcation diagram of the whole system. OK, so just to, this just says the same thing again. So I can take my operad 1. I have a functor to operad 2 that kind of takes uh, you know, the same boxes with a different, like kind of a simpler way of uh, looking at them. And there's a steady state analysis that's a natural transformation from one to another. So all I want to say in this slide is that some, we, an analysis is compositional if you get an isomorphism between analyzing and composing. But a generative effect would be one where you don't get to know the true uh, analysis of the model from analyzing the pieces. And that comes from a kind of inexactness of, the, your, anal of your analysis. And, and uh, a colleague of mine at MIT has a cohomological theory of these generative effects that allows you to understand uh, what's going on in, in the big model in terms of cohomological uh, aspects of, of the pieces. I think that's pretty neat. But I, I don't, just to summarize, I talked about compositionality, building one thing out of many. Uh, it'd be amazing to have a compositional analysis of materials. And um, we can describe string diagrams with, with uh, operads, and we can, we can think about dynamical systems in terms of steady states using, uh, there's a functor that, that does that. And that's it. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I had a question. I wanted to know what, what um, influence this presentation has on the inverse problem, which is, for example, so here you have a bunch of pieces, you know how they're connected, you get a result. And if you know less about some of the pieces, you get a, way, a range of possible results, right? What happens if you now say you know the end result, but you don't know some of the pieces? Can you go back and fill in the missing pieces? Um, so he asked, uh, this is saying if you have, if you know a, a system, how it's composed, and you know something about each piece, you can figure out something about the, the whole. And, and then the question is, uh, if you want to know something about the whole, can no, you figure out? You know the whole. You, you don't know the whole. And you, know how they're, you know something about the pieces and something about how they're connected. So it's like the inverse problem. Can you go in and fill in those details if you know what the system is? I certainly don't have a theory of how you can fill in the details of the, of the missing parts, uh, knowing, the, knowing uh, the whole and, and something about how they're arranged. But you would, sometimes I think of this as kind of like the question of, you know how to multiply, but what you really want to know is how to factor. Um, factoring is hard, multiplying is easy. 
And, but you couldn't factor if you didn't know what multiplication meant. So at least I'm, this is, that, that's kind of how I would summarize your question. And I would say, um, no, factoring is hard, I guess. <laughs> or, or whatever. I mean, it can be done, but you have to be clever. Okay. Yeah? I think we're cautious about say what I was going to say about systems analysis and compound design. I wasn't going to say that at all. Oh. <laughs> well, I was. Just to say that there is in computer science this idea of top-down design, where you have a system and you like to analyze it into these kind of components. Um, but the <coughs> approaches there are a little rather different. Yep. Go ahead. Just, yeah. So, did I understand correctly that you're proposing you have a diagrammatic way of understanding trace ideals? Because this is yes. something I would love to do. Oh yeah. Yes, I think so. I'd like to talk. I would, one, you have one to. Of the things freely allow people to just add caps as one normally does in compact those categories, then you'll have problems, right? So you have to have some restricted notion of these caps. You can't put caps on everything. On any traced on anything that's in the traced ideal you can. On things in the trace ideal you yeah, can yeah. but things that are not then you can't then yeah. you keep track of what's in them. Yeah, yeah you treat so what what you're allowed to put in a box oops, I went the wrong way. <laughs> that was that <laughs> Uh, what you're allowed to put in a box here is exactly the types of things that can be traced. Ah, and what you're allowed to put on a wire is anything. I see. So you don't, okay, so the pictures, you don't actually show that with different kinds of strings. Uh, the strings are, the, so this box has on its left and on its right, say, it has an object, two objects. And this box has two objects. And on this string is a morphism in your category. But what you're allowed to put in a box is something in the traced ideal. I was trying to develop a diagrammatic theory of nuclear ideas. We want to make some strings bendable and other strings not. Right. Not to allow caps. <clears throat> okay. We should talk sometime. Yep. Right? Yep. Uh, I wanted to ask if, um, sort of along the lines of Dana's uh, question, whether there is a way at the level of the string diagrams to understand feedback fixed points. Is there a way to unfold the diagrams to understand? the behavior of fixed points in some detail. It's a little, so you asked, is there a way to think about or understand the feedback and how it relates to fixed well, points? Fixed points and the fixed points, right. So uh, it's, I'm not sure exactly what to say. One thing I've said here was that um, fixed points or steady states are a compositional analysis. In other words, there is a functor um, that takes any dynamical system and returns its, feedback, uh, returns its fixed points as a matrix, and that is compositional in the sense that you can understand the fixed points of the whole system by composing the matrices uh, of the fixed points of the pieces. But um, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking. I was asking more in terms of um, uh, um, having some reflection in this formalism of the, say, the stages of the computation of the fixed point. Right, right, because usually when people talk about fixed points in, your sen in the sense you're talking about, they're talking about the actual computation as a whole and not the fixed points of some dynamical system. Um, I, would, uh, I would guess that there's a way, you know, we could, if we talked about it, we could find something, but, um, but I think, I think there is. I mean, uh, this, this fixed points, instead of thinking about these things as updating a state one at a time, the fixed points are involved in thinking about the entire hist a map from histories to histories. And it's a fixed point in that kind of place. Is that, is that, does that sound reasonable? OK, well, we could talk about it. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, one thing to be aware of in connection with that is obviously your setting is basically monoidal. Mm -hmm. And in the fixed points that people usually talk about in, in computer science, the setting is Cartesian. Yes. So it makes a difference. OK. Uh, I, mean, I, I, I just wanted to add one, one sort of uh, translational remark that I think your view of compositionality is very, very much of an uh, allied nature to what people talk about in computer science, but with a slightly different language. I mean, I think attributes, people would say properties. properties and then apart yeah. from the semantics being compositional, people are very interested in compositional methods of reasoning about systems. And I think that's where the connection is very direct. And going to simplified models or more effective reasoning, where one loses some information, gets one into the realm of static analysis and so on. Way of making an approximation in order to be able to do things more effectively. So I think it's very. Yeah, I, I would like to have the right terms to, to connect in with the um, with the existing literature. So, thanks. I think we're actually running a little bit. <coughs>
Um, you, you said that something about traces and identities don't oh. work together. Can you yeah. like state the simplest thing about what? Yeah. What um, so I said he. Uh, John asked. Uh, I said that traces in in a dynamical system you can't uh, have identities and traces and feedback and uh, without partiality. It's like something right. And so I guess the point is that. If my input is, um, if my output is directly affecting my input with no time delay between them, and my input is affecting my output with no time delay, then that becomes an equation to solve that f of x y equals x or something. And so um, you lose the fact that you, I mean, then only solutions to that equation will satisfy uh, the wiring diagram in some sense. So if, if you're so not every input of some bigger system would give an output, only the ones that made some equation. that made input equal output, right? Because you're putting input into output, and there's no time delay, yeah. Um, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's thank David again.